Okay, thank you <laughs> for coming. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so what I'm planning to do is uh, first give an introduction, and uh, then I will go a bit more in detail and show images from the different periods of, of Black Mountain. Uh, it's important to kind of understand what it was and how it transformed itself during the time that it existed and what happened after, what the aftermath of, of that quite long period. Um, and, uh, and then I have, I've done a number of uh, projects with students uh, related to Black Mountain. So I'd like to look at those uh, and, um, uh, and then there can be a discussion if there's anyone left. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just in terms of, okay, maybe we wait for the last ones. So I, um, I'm actually in the final preparation of a book that I've been working on for a few years um, about my, the two larger projects of mine uh, related to Black Mountain with students. One, a uh, performative uh, installation at the uh, Hamburg, ba Hamburger Bahnhof Museum within an ex a historical exhibition about Black Mountain in 2015, and the second is symposium that took place uh, at the Mutasius uh, Art Academy where I, I've been teaching. Um, and so that's finally in the complete uh, completion phase actually at the moment and I thought I would begin with um, uh, reading my introduction to that book part of it um, I don't normally like to read but at least give some you know basic uh, information about my um, or at least sums up my um, understanding or what was important to me about about the college and then we'll go into more detail um, and um, I should say that the, uh, probably the most important figure uh, uh, who was the, uh, whose writings and also uh, him personally um, uh, that uh, was associated with the founding of the college is the American philosopher and educator um, John Dewey, um, whose ideas were important for the founding of the college. Uh, he wrote a book very influential book in America, uh, uh, which was published, uh, I think, in the 1930s, uh, early 1930s, called um, Art as, uh, sorry, um, oh God, I'm completely blank now. <laughs> uh, I thought of it just a few minutes ago. Um, but uh, um, it's his, his thesis was the importance of of the arts in, in educational uh, practice, um, uh, art as experience, yeah. And uh, uh, I begin with a quote from him. It is by way of communication that art becomes the incomparable organ of instruction, but the way is so remote from the usually associated, what, with that which is usually associated with the idea of education. It is a way that lifts art so far above what we are accustomed to think of as instruction that we are repelled by any suggestion of teaching and learning in connection with art. And then I have a second quote that I begin this with, um, which is from the poet Robert Creeley. It's from sort of the end of the uh, history of Black Mountain College uh, when it was more associated with the, what was who were uh, called the Black Mountain Poets. Um, from the 1950s, uh, um, one time at Black Mountain, Charles Olson said to me, Charles Olson was the last director of Black Mountain College, I need a college to think with, meaning I understood that he wanted the multiplicity of instance, all particular and active, not the discrete or isolating possibilities of a chosen few. Come into the world, he said, take a big bite. So um, Black Mountain College uh, was founded in 1933, as I said, on uh, the reform uh, uh, principles of the reform educator John Dewey um, and by his colleague John Andrew Rice, who wanted to transform education that, so that schools would turn out people 
and this is a quote from John Rice, who will be eternally modern and as such distinguished not by what they will know, but by what they will do with what they know. Um, when we look at the history, uh, uh, we'll uh, see, uh, talk a little bit about the various directors of, 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 uh, of the college, but John Andrew Rice was a direct, sort of indirect lineage to the ideas of, Ju of Dewey uh, and um, actually was the individual who founded the college. The college represented an ongoing dialogue where the institutional, philosophical, and pedagogical aspects of education were continually re-examined and applied in the world. This, dis this discussion took place within a context of intense intellectual cohabitation in extreme geographical isolation with the goal of developing the whole person. So um, an important aspect to uh, uh, Black Mound is that it was, um, uh, as it's written, uh, isolated geographically um, uh, in a part of the southern United States, which is that time, and it's to some degree still quite um, a conservative. And uh, of course, it was in a time where, um, uh, even though it was it's only a few hours from the nearest cities, was um, uh, uh, very isolating. So it had a, a very strong, um, I think, influence on how the school developed. Controversial debates on academic structures and content lasting over more than two decades often resulted in enormous upheaval and conflict. Yet it is precisely this discourse which is so uh, pertinent and urgent today. So I found actually that, um, uh, that this, uh, the history of Black Mountain is actually a history of, of conflict and uh, questions about what the school should be about whether it should give grades, whether it should have rules or standards, um, uh, and even more importantly, this will come again and again, whether it's an art school or not. So in fact, it was not an art school, so this is also very important. Um, but there were those who wanted to turn it into an art school, purely an art school. Um, the college was inherently an interdisciplinary environment in which artistic practice and theory resonated across mediums and further to and from the natural sciences, mathematics, and beyond. So again, uh, it was founded and more or less uh, till its uh, demise in 1957, there was the attempt to teach the arts in a context of um, of the other disciplines. Uh, in many cases, they were not able to represent all different scientific and uh, sort of the, from the hard and soft sciences, all areas, but um, that was the attempt. Um, <clears throat> uh, faculty and students participated willingly in subject areas which were often foreign to their intended line of study or their individual academic backgrounds. So. Uh, it was encouraged that um, even if you were studying, I don't know, geology or uh, uh, taking, majoring in French, that you would also take part in, um, in dance or uh, in the visual arts. And also within the arts, um, uh, it was encouraged that you would participate or at least take courses and actually you know, in, in um, resulting in performances or exhibitions in areas that were foreign to you. So there's the famous pictures of Robert Rauschenberg dancing, uh, which is quite well known uh, and in the dance class. Um, yet this high level of interdisciplinary exchange was not restricted to the arts. The college retained the Dewey dictum of arts teaching as an essential experiential component to the development of a reflective and critical personality in contextual dialogue with the natural and social sciences. Uh, indeed, the internal calls for the transformation of the college into an arts academy after the Second World War were rejected after a bitter internal rupture or dispute after which many important faculty members left the college. Okay, we'll look at this later. The initial educational vision in which the arts were taught within a liberal arts context was retained. Ironically, we continue to experience the segregation of the disciplines in the academies, as if many historical examples of interdisciplinary research and educational artistic exchange had never taken place. So I think this is very important to me personally. Um, not only have I 
spent the last years teaching in an art academy in which um, is incredibly difficult uh, f uh, inter inter uh, interchange and and uh, interdisciplinary work between uh, the, the different areas of the visual arts, you know, the professor in painting, the professor in sculpture, et cetera, and uh, uh, within the institution itself. And in fact, I'm also a member of what's called the Academy of Arts, Academy der Kunst in Berlin, uh, which is incredibly segregated, so into the different areas and extremely difficult for any kind of, um, uh, yeah, sort of uh, interaction. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've often wondered, you know, thinking of the year that we're in, how hard and how difficult this, uh, this is really to, to break these uh, traditions and understandings. Uh, today, the term experiment often ref infers non-completion and failure, but its persistent use in relation to Black Mountain might be better understood in reference uh, to its Latin root exper experimentum as a trial run and exploratory testing of proving ground. Um, as a kind of, uh, uh, do we um, uh, spoke about the the uh, sort of a testing of of creative practice uh, in relation to experience? Um, and then here's a quote from Eva Diaz that wrote an interesting book about Black Mountain uh, and experimentation. Uh, quote: If experiment can be understood as both a test of tradition and a search for innovative outcomes, more generally we can begin to see the work of a composer, an artist, and an architect as, or as organized by a shared methodology, albeit with different results. So, of course, as you see, because I did a concert last night, I talked about my visual work yesterday, and now I'm talking about this. So it, this has to do also with my own understanding of artistic practice. Uh, we recall the words of John Dewey. He wrote in 1931, quote, all education is experimental whether we call it that or not. Uh, invoking pedagogy as a process, uh, this is also from his, uh, his, he quotes Kant, since we must be guided by experiments, no one generation can set forth a complete scheme of education. Former students and faculty recall that while the college from its very inception, from its beginning, actively dispensed with many of the structures which one associates with a quote normative academic institution. So, for instance, lack of official accreditation. Uh, the college never had any accreditation from any educational institution outside. That means they didn't even actually give degrees. They kind of, you know, met together and said, yes, it's good what you did. Uh, but many of the students actually never actually bothered with that. And uh, there wasn't a, uh, for a period, an association with some universities. Um, Gropius was in Harvard and he managed to uh, arrange something where they could take some more courses and then uh, uh, get a degree more easily. But um, this was never the case that uh, uh, that there was a, um, not, not only was there no final diploma of any kind that you could show, but uh, there were also no grades, yeah. Um, so, uh, the participants at the college demonstrate unusual intensity of personal commitment and responsibility. So I think this is also very important that, um, uh, so in all reports about the college, um, they kind of talk about a sink or swim uh, uh, kind of experience where, you know, if you missed a few days, you wouldn't, it would be hard to find your way back in. So, um, so if you were, so we're required because there was not, a kind of um, the uh, uh, standard uh, 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 f formats of, of uh, um, uh, you know, sort of indicating your progress and so forth um, and rewarding your work. So it required a, uh, an enormous personal commitment uh, and, and interest. Um, so where was I here? Um, the social and existential needs for institutional survival often precipitated radical solutions, resulting in full student and faculty participation in building construction, collective administration, and even farming in order to supply the school's basic needs. So we will look at this a bit later and talk about how difficult it was to keep this going. Yeah, so uh, it was in a, almost in a continual state of crisis, but it required that everyone 
I mean, more than pitching in, but um, uh, that uh, uh, there was a sense of, you know, collective need and uh, which meant that um, uh, one had to participate in in construction and uh, also growing the food just that they would not not because they were ideologically for uh, farming in any way as, as something that came much later uh, as we all know but because they they didn't have enough money to feed themselves um, regardless if one experienced the pre or post-war period at the college that's because they were very different um, or whether duration, the duration of one's individual involvement was long-term or cut short, and experience to the, um, the Black Mountain community often permanently changed lives, as evidenced in the oral and written testimonies of former students and faculty. So as I mentioned yesterday, there were students who were there for many years, um, but there are also uh, many occasions of, of uh, testimonies from those who were there for a very short time, and um, even those who didn't even remain in the arts or who ended up with very different careers talk about it as the seminal moment in their lives. Uh, and then I wrote a statement which is actually interesting because this was written two years ago. In our contemporary geopolitical climate, regional and international uh, organizations in national states are again on the defense against ever more anti-democratic forces. We might examine the history of Black Mountain as an exercise in political awareness and action. From its inception, that means so from its beginning, the college defines itself as an institution on the front lines, educating or seeing itself as educating the responsible citizen for democratic discourse. Um, and here I have a quote from John Dewey during the war years, speaking about the college. The work and life of the college, and it is an impossible in its case to separate the two, the work and life, is a living example of democracy in action. No matter how the present crisis comes out, he's writing during the Second World War, the need for the kind of work the college does is imperative in the long run interests of democracy. The college exists at the very grassroots of a democratic way of life. So um, uh, the, uh, just the term, democracy and comes again and again in uh, through all the periods of Black Mountain's existence and uh, um, uh, of course as we will see and I'm going to mention now so the uh, the most of the uh, professors and faculty uh, in the early years were refugees from uh, Germany. Uh, in Europe, the closing of the Bauhaus and the subsequent descent into fascism resulted in a cultural transfer of European intellectuals directly to the isolated small college in North Carolina, a fact, that, uh, fact which greatly influenced the character of the college well into the 1950s. So we know um, in the States, or it's, it, only in the last years have been really looked at closely, um, the influence in general of European intellectual refugees on the intellectual life in the post-war period in the States, not only in the case of Black Mountain, but you know Berkeley, for instance, uh, but many universities uh, in psychoanalysis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, uh, in the case of Black Mountain, um, I will, we will also look at this in more detail. Uh, there was a kind of an underground railroad in the sense that um, uh, especially German refugees and especially German Jewish refugees um, in order to get, it was very difficult to get into the States. Uh, in fact, the, there were very few refugees that, that made it to the States at that time. And uh, one of the problems was they needed a job. So this was a perfect kind of uh, marriage of goals um, in, in that uh, um, they could be, you know, the college had just been founded in 1933 and, uh, and then the Bauhaus immediately closed. We'll look at this a little bit more in a moment. But uh, um, it was a, a, a kind of a combination of, of needs from the side of the college and also for the needs on the side of the refugees. Joseph and Annie Albers, along with Ted Dreyer and Walter Gropius, arranged badly needed work visas for the mostly Jewish artists and intellectuals escaping from Germany, directing them by train from New York, from the New York docks to rural North Carolina. During the war years, national priorities focus on defense efforts and the college experienced severe difficulties in maintaining itself financially. As the first in this stream of refugees from Europe, Joseph Albers, in a speech in New York, which took place three days before the evacuation of Paris, 
spoke words which resonate uncannily to our own time. Um, this is a speech that he gave at MoMA, actually. Uh, uh, and uh, um, as I said, uh, 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 during the war years, and he writes, it may seem frivolous now when all ears and eyes, when all minds are occupied with the frightening events abroad to speak in such a situation about education. If we emphasize the imaginative mind to the administrative one, the productive to the possessive one, the creative one to the imitative one, if we believe more in responsibility than in success and profit, then we can prepare more for citizenship than for jobs. Then we can develop personalities, personalities able to lead themselves instead of developing leaders longing for followers and masses. So with that, we're gonna look a little bit at the history of the school. Um, and as I mentioned, um, Andrew Rice uh, um, was uh, a re uh, what would be called now a kind of a reformist educator uh, who um, was from the Southern United States and he was a, uh, a professor at um, a small college uh, which was uh, also in the South, in Georgia, called Rollins College. Um, and there were another, um, a number of other uh, educators who were very influenced by Dewey there. One of them was Ted Dreyer. This is very interesting because Ted Dreyer was um, the nephew of Kathleen Dreyer, who was the founder of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and a famous collector, also from a refugee German family. And the two of them, with some other um, maybe less interesting personalities, um, were thrown out of the college for being too radical. This is in the late 1920s. <laughs> and uh, um, this is Andrew Rice on the lower right, and Ted Dreyer is on the lower left. Uh, and so they got together and they managed to get some uh, support. I mean, the college was always looking for um, personal contributions from wealthy individuals. And in that, Ted Dreyer was very important because through his, his, his aunt and his family in New York, they had a lot of connections. So this also will be important historically. And uh, they were offered a former um, uh, uh, campus. Oh, thank you. Uh, which was, I thought you were gonna interrupt me and tell <laughs> So a, uh, a campus in North Carolina. Uh, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, in a town called Black Mountain. Uh, it was built as a Christian college in the 19th century, um, and they basically they rented it uh, uh, in the first years. And so there were two campuses for Black Mountain. This is the first campus, and okay, just again, Black Mountain existed from 1933 to 1957. So, uh, and during that period, there were enormous changes in the faculty and different periods. So, which leads to the fact that many people who think about Black Mountain, they're usually thinking about yeah, a certain period, you know, either the early period or the late period. Or actually, I, I kind of divide into three different periods and two different campuses. Um, this is a picture I took when I visited there, so both campuses still exist. They have, you know, this is now a quite conservative Catholic, no, not Catholic, but Chris, some kind of a Christian camp summer camp, uh, actually both campuses are Christian summer camps, this is a very conservative area, even though Asheville itself has become a kind of a, a hip town, it was not at that time. And uh, so uh, these rocking chairs are shown in many of the photos, the early photos of teaching use with the rocking chairs, uh, and it's kind of legendary, and they're still there. Um, so uh, this is a picture of, of um, Joseph and Andy Albers, and actually the story is that uh, Rice felt that he needed some really important educational figure. Uh, and uh, um, in a conversation with um, uh, uh, a number of, actually a number of, arch at a meeting of architects, um, it was, he was recommended um, to, uh, to invite Joseph Albers, and it was a very, yeah, so interesting moment because uh, uh, the Bauhaus had just uh, been closed, and uh, uh, and this is Yosef and Annie, Annie Albers um, uh, is from Jewish background, um, but um, they both needed to leave, and uh, uh, it was clear that they had no future 
uh, and uh, the developments in Germany. And actually, it was Ted Dreyer who wrote to Albers, who wrote back, um, I think I have, and actually, you could, okay, this is actually in the wrong order. No, I don't have the letter here. But um, uh, uh, he wrote to him, we're, you know, founding this college, and uh, we are um, uh, um, looking for uh, someone to lead the faculty in the arts. And uh, um, this is actually a picture of them taken as I got off the boat. You can <laughs> look at his face. Look. And he wrote back, actually, look, I don't really speak English. Uh, my wife speaks a little bit of English, but we're ready to leave right away. Yeah, so... Um, uh, and this, of course, was a very important moment, as we'll see. Um, uh, these are pictures of them from the early period. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a text, maybe interesting text from Theodore Dreyer um, uh, about his ideas. He was also not only someone who was important in fundraising, but also in um, uh, so, um, writing out the goals and somehow trying to define what the college was standing for. Uh, the essence of life of Black Mountain is a cutting out of all this paraphernalia which clutters up much, at most education, the great accumulation of fraternities, aesthetics, and student politics that has been built up in the name of college life and getting down to human beings. Um, uh, this uh, goes back to, again, to Dewey, who, had, uh, who wrote that uh, education should uh, consider the whole person and not uh, cut it into little pieces and compartmentalize uh, the individual. Briefly, the idea has been to deal with the individual at every point instead of with masses of students and what is more, the college is concerned with the whole business of living in a changing world, not merely what happens in the classroom and not merely uh, with a student's intellectual development. And that is why the intimate contact exists between faculty and students as responsible members of the small community in the college was so important. Um, maybe, okay, I read some of those things later. Um, I have here like a video, but it's okay a bit. You can't, it's from the Joseph Albers Foundation. Maybe I come back to it and we see if we come back to it. Um, and uh, uh, this is from a text by Annie Albers. And okay, we should say it's actually interesting to talk about Annie Albers because she's a bit somehow historically and until recently in the shadow of Joseph Albers, who was an uh, important educator from the Bauhaus. And um, uh, um, she, um, uh, she tells that when she was admitted to the Bauhaus, that because she was a woman, she was sent in the basement to the weaving class. Yeah? And it's interesting how she turned that into a life work. Uh, and um, it's only in recent years there was a, a huge retrospective in London that looked at her work. And of course, it has to do with reconsideration about female artists. And, uh, um, but um, uh, her work, I mean, they, they were really a, a working pair and uh, also with tremendous intellectual uh, exchange. Um, but okay, I just read the first, the first paragraph of, what she, of something that she wrote. Uh, life today, this is written in 19, uh, late 1930s, life today is very bewildering. We have no picture of it which is all-inclusive, such as former times may have had. We have to make a choice between concepts of great diversity, and as a common ground is wanting, we are baffled by them. We must find our way back to simplicity of conception in order to find ourselves. So, um, yeah, very con con contemporary text. Uh, and here from Joseph Albers. Uh, um, okay, this is actually from a, a, t a catalog from Black Mountain, and I, uh, I have uh, images from various, the various catalog catalogs, but life is more important than school, the student and the learning, more important than the teacher and the teaching. Okay, it's a little bit German-English. More lasting than having heard or read it is to have seen and experienced. Again, going back to John Dewey importance of experience. The result of the work of the school is difficult to determine while the pupil is in school. The best proofs are the results in later life, not, for example, in student exhibitions. So he often said that he was, um, when asked what was his goal, he would say to teach his students to see. Um, okay, I mean, so you can, uh, if, I don't know how familiar you are with his work, um, I have to say for myself, I mean, the, the cliche of, of Joseph Albers is the homage to the square, which, of which he painted over and over again uh, for many, many years. But it's also interesting um, 
that his work really changed when he got to Black Mountain. So um, his, his work was certainly more utilitarian in the spirit of the Bauhaus. And um, as he came to Black Mountain, he was also in tremendous isolation. Uh, the work up on the upper left is uh, inspired by a trip to Mexico and looking at Mexican uh, ruins in the Yucatan. And actually, the, that's from the period of Black Mountain. The almost of the square began shortly after. Um, Again, so as contrasts, uh, works by um, uh, uh, tapestries and uh, uh, weaving works by uh, Andy Albers. Um, and, okay, we, we'll look at some of the bulletins. So, again, so the two periods are um, defined by, well, let's say the first period, um, essentially, uh, predominantly faculty, not not exclusively, but predominantly faculty uh, of refugees, and uh, um, and then speaking about uh, for, you know the the need to encompass a much larger body of knowledge than was possible in a very small college. Um, uh, it was often the case, so a pair would come from, often from Germany, and uh, you know the husband would be a uh, a composer or a conductor or an art historian, and his wife would be, for instance, a biologist or uh, uh, something or other. So both would just begin to teach in order to um, uh, make it possible to to cover different areas. This is an image of the second campus. Um, uh, which is Lake Eden. It's on a, a lake, which you can just see. We'll see that over and over again. And the building, which you see, is um, was actually built by the uh, uh, students themselves. Um, uh, originally, they asked for Gropius to uh, uh, Walter Gropius, who was a good friend of uh, uh, of the Albers from the Bauhaus, to design, and he did design. Uh, uh, together with his partners, uh, a new uh, building, but it was too expensive for them. So they, a student of Gropius then um, uh, came up with plans for a simpler building, which they realized themselves. We'll look into that. There's a picture of that. Um, so I don't know, you probably can't really see these documents. Uh, um, and uh, But down below, I, I have this in here because, okay, this is a spring, spring semester from 1949. Just to give an idea of the kind of, of courses, there's a list of courses below. Uh, American fiction, reading the achievement of Marcel Proust, French, German, Russian, linguistics, botany, introduction to mathematics, calculus, etc., etc., physics, American history, theory of knowledge, philosophy, anthropology, and music appreciation. So um, how wide the, um, uh, this uh, uh, curriculum was. This is an image from, I believe, 19... 49. Um, this is not really chronological. Um, uh, interesting here is that, okay, Joseph and Annie Albers on the right. It was shortly before they left the college. Um, they are then uh, Walter Gropius in the suit with the bow tie. Um, uh, on the left uh, is, okay, I forget the name, is a, is a Japanese student, a Japanese-American, um, and an African-American. So this is also uh, something that um, uh, comes up a bit later, um, that uh, in terms of integration. So it was so uh, 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 racist at that time in the South that to have African-American or non-white students or faculty come to the college, they had to hire a special car on a train from the north, and which was segregated. And um, when they arrived in, uh, I think the station was in Asheville, um, they had to be uh, picked up and driven into the college. And while other students and faculty could go out and have a drink at the, in the town at the bar, um, it was too dangerous for them to do so. And there were long periods of discussion about uh, uh, bringing in, uh, especially African American students. Um, uh, there were initiatives, uh, uh, and uh, interestingly, the the and for some periods, the refugees in the early period were afraid because they had just uh, uh, had to escape from Europe and. Uh, you would think that they would be more open to that, but there are actually discussions in which uh, some of the em emigrants were afraid that they would uh, um, uh, lose their their status or their new homes. And in fact, you know, there was a fear that the local pop 
population would actually burn the college down. Uh, so these were real fears and uh, just shows the situation in the States at that time. Um, uh, these are, you know, different posters. So um, maybe also I should maybe explain that. Um, so uh, the first period was heavily dominated by the influence of Albers. Um, the founder of the college, Andrew Rice, uh, uh, was forced to leave after a few years. He, he was um, uh, evidently a very uh, dynamic personality. Uh, but um, I think, I mean, in... in uh, let me just say that my, you know, even though the writings are, the evidence is, is from an earlier period, my impression is that um, uh, the uh, Me Too period was uh, even there um, that he misbehaved. So, uh, and he was forced to leave, um, and uh, at which time Albers became the uh, uh, most important figure. And uh, there were literally close friends of his and associates who came from Germany in different fields uh, and uh, um, uh, mixed with also uh, American staff. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, had a very strong music program. Uh, a professor was a student of Arnold Schoenberg came. I mean, they basically got the highest level of uh, intellectuals and scientists from uh, from Germany especially, and of course it was through a network that Albers and Gropius and others had. Um, a very interesting figure is Max Dane, who is one of the few figures who lasted through almost all the periods of the college, who is one of the few emigres who is not from Berlin but from Frankfurt. He's a very famous mathematician who worked with uh, theorems that define space. And um, uh, interesting story, he, d he was buried at Black Mountain on the campus. There's a, there's a gravestone with his wife. His wife also taught, I think, biology. And um, he, uh, uh, interesting in, in many artists who were at Black Mountain in the 40s and 50s, when they're asked, like, who was their most interesting influence and instructor, there are many that say Max Dane. So, you know, there's pictures of him. He would draw his theorems he would start on the blackboard and then he would continue on the floor and then he would continue on the walls and then on the ceiling um, uh, uh, and uh, almost create an installation. And uh, I also found in a uh, John Cage, who's a very important composer, who's famous for collecting mushrooms. Um, and I found an uh, indication in an interview with Cage um, uh, in relation to Black Mountain, which is unpublished, uh, that... Um, uh, it was actually Max Dane who turned him on to mushrooms and in walking around the campus. So there are these really interesting figures, very important music program uh, in philosophy in the early years, the 30s and 40s. Um, and, uh, you know, I have to, you know, not, we don't take too long. Uh, I try to condense it. Um, there came a, a, uh, a kind of schism at the, uh, in the 1940s. I mean, they survived the war years. It was extremely difficult because, uh, um, you know, all of the financial resources put, in, put into the war effort. Um, there was incredible discussions. As I read a few short parts about what is our purpose here? Is it, you know, is it important? Should some of us leave and go fight in the war, or is this important what we're doing? So they tried to de redefine why they were there, and then, of course, um, uh, speaking about um, uh, the relation of education to democracy. Um, and the schism came about because of you know, various factors, but um, uh, Albers uh, had the idea to turn it into an art school. And uh, um, uh, at this transition point, um, they were, uh, the war years are very difficult. At the end of the war, they were having, again, tremendous financial problems. And the, um, uh, 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 Albers began uh, um, what was called the Summer Academies. Uh, and the Summer Academies is often what is co most commonly known about Black Mountain. And they were often only a few weeks long. And that's, you know, that's the period where, 
um, the abstract expressionists came to Kooning and uh, uh, John Cage and, of course, Buckminster Fuller, a very important figure, um, and many others. Uh, uh, and it's uh, often interesting to see how short they actually were, but how, what an incredible influence these periods had. So, um, but uh, it was Albers that instituted them actually to make some money. You know, to get students to come down, students and faculty to come down to the campus for a short period, which was beneficial to, to the college. But um, there's a interesting text from um, Elaine de Kooning uh, where she writes that if at that point they were so poor that if they hadn't you know, had those few summer academies, they she doesn't know how they would survive. Merce Cunningham, the choreographer. Uh, had no uh, um, uh, had at that point no uh, possibility for um, uh, dance rehearsals, and they were also extremely poor. And so this was a very important connection also to New York, and uh, and as we will see that uh, also later. So um, uh, so the the second period would be I would say from forty seven forty eight. Uh, with the introduction sort of having a more American char uh, character and uh, heavily influenced by the New York avant-garde. So in painting and music um, and uh, new ideas of community, also in, in other disciplines. Uh, and uh, even though some of the emigres did remain, yeah, uh, those who survived, some left to go teach at other colleges that could pay something because, of course, the faculty was paid very little, uh, the students paid very little, and um, so uh, some went to look for more lucrative uh, uh, possibilities. Um, here's an advertisement from Black Mountain. I think this is from the late 40s. Uh, it explains where Black Mountain is. Uh, we have facilities for 90 students. There are at present 22 faculty members. Students live in lodges. Everyone has his own study in the student, student building. Um, we have no separate in administration or board of trustees. So the students and the faculty made decisions together. You know, of course, uh, there's also, of course, tensions there, but um, uh, uh, sometimes very uh, difficult discussions, but... Um, uh, there was no, it was very non-hierarchical, uh, or at least an attempt to be non-hierarchical. And, uh, um, okay, fees are arranged within limits according to the individual's possibility to pay. Okay, a place to learn and live. This is a very typical advertising text for Black Mountain. Uh, if you're interested in the world you live in and the way men think and act, if you're interested in finding a purpose in your own working and learning, Black Mountain will attract you. Okay. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so uh, admission does not depend on your financial well-being or on the results of examinations. It depends upon you. Yeah. Uh, uh, McCoy actually gives some prices here, but I know that many students didn't pay it. Uh, and um, it's an interesting story of... Uh, 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 a friend of mine um, who's now in his 90s, who uh, was hitchhiking, a Gerd Stern, an early media artist, founded USCO. He told me he, and he's himself a German refugee, and uh, um, he told me that he was hitchhiking in the area of Black Mountain on his way somewhere, and someone uh, uh, said he was looking for a place to sleep, and someone said, okay, there's this kind of strange campus, college in the area, maybe they'll put you up. And uh, he showed up there and uh, uh, only looking for a place to stay and ended up being a student for years. So, you know, it's a typical situation that um, it didn't always uh, uh, go through these, these, these uh, uh, avenues. Uh, again, democracy, Black Mountain's democracy is more than word or concept. It is a way of living. Owned and controlled by its faculty, the college bases this democracy in a unique charter legally providing for student participation in all college affairs. Community problems are discussed in community meetings, and students annually agree among themselves on the few basic standards which seem necessary to govern their lives. Um, Arts at Black Mountain is based on art as an active, appreciative, and creative force permeating all activities of life. It attempts to aid the student to see in the widest sense, to open his eyes to his own living, being, and doing. Okay. Uh, uh, certain, okay. 
problems of architecture. This is, this is in the period that they built the, um, a number of the buildings in the second campus. Uh, the problems of architecture, the problems of shelter for millions of people. The low-cost home of today and the planned community of tomorrow, a com more complex, complete use of new materials and new processes, a way of building centered around a way of living. Uh, okay, architecture classes at Black Mountain do not spend their time discussing a utopian future. Stu students design and construct, in addition to the kitchen or the library, a new dairy barn, quarters for the kitchen staff, a faculty home, a, a student study building. Uh, they discover the architecture is hammering nails and pouring cement. I should say that, okay, because we're going to come also to uh, something uh, here where talking about farming, that um, they didn't have enough money to build the building. So it was also partially necessity and partially um, yeah, a, um, or at least turned into a, uh, a, a kind of, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, rationale for uh, looking at new ways of living. The texts are often very, could be a contemporary text. Um, and, but there were those who had, to, you know, there's many accounts of students and faculty who had never built anything. You know, you'd have like, a, you know, a German composer who's, you know, uh, has never actually done any physical work who ends up having to, <laughs> to take part in the, in, in, in the building construction and farming. Uh, music in Black Mountain is not only a part of the curriculum, an essential element of community life. It's a very nice story about music that um, I always like to tell that I came across in some document that in a period in the 30s and 40s when they had a concert, of course there were very few people from outside the campus at these concerts. And they, you know, they had you know, world-renowned uh, uh, musicians there. And they, so they decided at some point not to only play one work at the concert, and um, because if there are more, this is more than one work, you leave the concert with the last piece that you heard in your head, you know, which is actually very true, um, that generally when you hear more pieces at, you know, which was typical in shorter pieces that you would not leave with the last, you would uh, maybe some of the last ones you heard or one or two of them would be more dominant. So it was a luxury that they had because there was no money involved that they could make a concert which was maybe five minutes or ten minutes and uh, and that be the work and then they would walk away and and sort of it would have a tremendous influence on all the students and of course it was assumed that everything that happened would be interesting for everyone so um, the dining hall was also the meeting hall is where theater took place uh, faculty and when there was a theater performance faculty and students acted did everything so themselves um, and if they were outside guests, they were usually those who were visiting from New York or the West Coast. Uh, hear more about uh, uh, building, about community. Um, okay, and it says here at the end, people at the college spend from 10 to 15 hours a week chopping wood, cutting corn, driving the chapter, working in the office. A student may manage the college store. He may report college news. He may dig a ditch. Most students do several such jobs. Uh, this is a picture of the dining hall. Okay, this is maybe not so interesting for you. I found a, a, a series of menus from a week at Black Mountain, <laughs> what they <laughs> ate. Um, uh, this is coming into the 50s. So some of the brochures, they had their own printing press. And of course, with people coming from the, Bla the influence of the Bauhaus, they had incredible uh, uh, kind of a design uh, stamp. Uh, uh, building process is building the second studies building, which is still there. Uh, uh, I was fortunate to have been there, and I had to sneak in because it's now a, a, a summer camp. Um, this is also an ex was an experimental building built by students and designed by architecture students. Uh, again, democracy in action is a little bit too small for me to read, but uh, um, yeah, they, this is from 1941. Uh, <laughs> about the building of the main studies building, building project and work program. Um, there's uh, a number of, of, of individuals who uh, are not so well known, but I think were very important there. One is this uh, figure, uh, Zante Shavinsky, who was actually a Romanian Jewish emigre, but who studied at the Bauhaus, evidently, uh, didn't get along with Oscar Schlemmer. He also he he was interested in um, and actually he defined a kind of a uh, uh, when we one of the earliest 
practitioners, I would say, in retrospect of uh, a kind of multimedia theater uh, with light projections, uh, abstract. Um, there's some elements which uh, one recognizes from the Baus and also from Oscar Schlemmer, but uh, um, his uh, projects in the late 1930s and early 40s are quite uh, uh, experimental, and um, uh, he's only been sort of rediscovered in the last few years. Uh, and of course, Buckminster Fuller. This is he was there at the same time as John Cage. Uh, it was actually Albers who invited him. I don't know how much of you know about him. Uh, this uh, goes in another tangent, but um, it's actually very hard to explain who he was because it's uh, uh, he was very became very well known in the uh, 1960s, 1970s, uh, first in America and then worldwide. Um, as a thinker, um, an, uh, an architect who was not trained as an architect, an inventor who was not trained as a, in any technical sense. He actually, um, uh, when he was young, he, uh, he stopped speaking for a year and uh, to decide what was he going to do. And then he decided he was going to spend his life um, uh, inventing structures and, and vehicles and, and uh, ways of living to save mankind. So he was a utopian thinker, and he's the inventor of the geodesic dome, which is something that you've all seen everywhere. I mean, from my formative years as a hippie with long hair, it was very prominent. I heard him speak once at the college that I went to, the undergraduate college, and he spoke for something like four hours. I'll never forget it. I mean, people were dropping out of their seats, but it was so incredibly inspiring. And in fact, he built, he had planned this earlier, and um, he built the first geodesic dome at Black Mountain. And uh, what's interesting is that the first one they built, I don't know if I have the picture here of the one that, yeah, the, uh, no, I don't have the picture of the one that failed. But uh, uh, the first one he built, uh, in the first, this was also in the summer programs, again, so not in the full faculty, year-long educational period, um, but uh, in the first summer that he was there, uh, the first one fell down. <laughs> And uh, the students were, and everybody was very disappointed because, of course, he, you know, talked for days and months about this. And, uh, um, and he said, no problem. That's how uh, work is developed. And, uh, and he got to work on it again. There's um, uh, Kenneth, uh, okay, no, I don't remember his name. There was an artist there who also worked with some of the areas together with, with uh, uh, Fuller, um, who... Uh, had some hand in, in, in inventing some of the, the tensile structures that made it possible, but he came back the next summer and it worked. And, uh, uh, and there were composers and uh, uh, dancers and various people from different fields who helped work with, with uh, Bucky. And here he is. Uh, there's Albers on the right. Uh, this is some drawings I found from when I was doing the working on the exhibition in the Hamburger Bahnhof from they're now in the uh, Stanford University of his drawings which were done beforehand and here's him acting in a play that the um, that was a collective uh, 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 theater performance a collective also in the writing of it and also in the um, uh, in acting and staging it and here on the lower right is um, in various roles is Merce Cunningham uh, with the hat that's Buck Mr. Fuller and John Cage is just behind him and there are another, a number of other important figures from Black Mountain who took part. Um, again, the period of John Cage was uh, in the summer academies, uh, incredibly inf influential this period. Uh, and um, yeah, some posters from this period now were in the early 50s. Uh, 1952 was a very important year. Uh, David Tudor, uh, M.C. Richards, uh, who is a very important figure. It's, it, it goes to too long to go into all the biographies. Um, he wrote a very, some very inf influential books on um, on uh, uh, creation of pottery. There was actually a very strong, what we would call today, crafts part of the college, um, although they were all considered on the equal level. Um, and she was the f first translation uh, translator. Uh, she translated the first edition of Antoine uh, Artaud, uh, 
um, uh, theater as this double, I only know it in English, um, uh, into, into uh, uh, first English translation, and, and there were readings at the college in which Cage and others took part in. Um, so uh, I think the interdisciplinary nature then really exploded at this period. That's my impression. And there's uh, Merce Cunningham. Uh, um, okay, this, there's a link here. But this is also, he composed, John Cage composed Williams' mix, which is, um, uh, they worked for months and months on it, uh, which is cutting up pieces as a score for cutting up pieces of magnetic tape. And um, I wanted to focus on this. It was a very important performance. It has been also very inspiring to me. In 1952, uh, from John Cage, um, uh, and, it's, and it's a performance which has been uh, spoken about by those who is one of those things where everyone was there tells a different story. It also has two different names, uh, process number one, and I think uh, if it was performance number one, something like that. And um, uh, uh, this is a drawing, okay, in the upper left is a drawing of the situation of the performance. Those triangles are, is where the audience sat, uh, process number one, and the, where the audience sat, and then the performing elements were in between, so somehow in this areas in the X. Um, and this drawing below is from some of the, I don't know, no, from some of the um, participants in the performance. Uh, there were others. Uh, uh, these are drawings from people who remembered it. And basically, Cage gave each of the performers a little snippet of paper, like just not even a full piece of paper, a little crumb of paper. Uh, and he wrote on it something like uh, 752 to 759. And then the next line would be 801 to 812, yeah? These were times, like durations, yeah? And, uh, and that was it. So he said, just, you know, use your watch and go out there and do something, you know? And of course, these were incredible, interesting people. So, you know, Merce Cunningham was dancing. Uh, here it says, Franz Klein suspended some kind of a campus art painting live. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg played a, a photograph, there were poets, there were musicians, um, and uh, uh, it, it, from the accounts of the performance, everyone was really shocked, you know, because, um, uh, of course, it had to do with the contemporaneous events, events happening at the same time, which are planned as individual events, but then collide with each other uh, in time. And, uh, and, of course, through that, you know, we say the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, something takes place. And so it's been quite, a, I think, a, also a model for me in, with, um, uh, uh, for many of my work in performance. Uh, okay, so a piece of Rauschenberg, I mean, Cy Twomley. Um, actually, that's the picture on the upper left. Uh, that's from the exhibition in the Hamburger Bahnhof of, um, of, uh, Okay, you can't see it very well, but that's uh, Rauschenberg dancing in the dance class. And uh, uh, this is actually Elaine de Kooning talking about the time there. Uh, on the left, uh, uh, Ruth Asawa, uh, very interesting artist uh, who was raised in one of the uh, internment camps for Japanese citizens of the United States during the Second World War. I don't know how well it's known here. It's only you know, been spoken about even in the States over the last 10 years, really, uh, uh, in the press and in the media. Um, she came very young to Black Mountain. She was a, um, a student of Albers and uh, uh, um, is also one of the female artists who has only been recently, uh, I mean, she was known in the San Francisco area, but has been uh, very well um, uh, discussed on the right, um, uh, okay, I suddenly forget the name, but is a, um, actually I shouldn't have this here, there were a number of quite interesting um, African-American artists also uh, at the college, but I just want to show some of the works of Asawa, which are these hanging transparent um, or uh, 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 sort of modules um, and uh, uh, there have been a number of exhibitions over uh, the last few years and, and interesting monographs that have come out. Uh, and she was an, also an educator then afterwards. It's one of the figures that just continued 
uh, after from her brief period of Black Mountain. Uh, this is actually from a photographer there. Uh, from These are different. Uh, okay, this is then come to the last phase. So the last phase begins around 53 to 57. Um, and uh, it's a difficult phase to talk about. So uh, I actually, um, uh, it's the period what I would say is a kind of dissolution of the college or the, you know, the period of the end. Um, the last rector of the college after Albers left, uh, uh, there was a bit of an interim period, was this figure Charles Olson, uh, who is a writer and poet, a uh, very dominant, very male figure. Um, uh, and uh, um, then comes a whole another series of connections, uh, what was later called the Black Mountain Poets, but a, a number of very important literary figures from uh, the States and those who've had a very strong influence later. Um, uh, this is also, okay, he was someone who was famous for um, he would give uh, lectures and he would start in the afternoon if he was an alcoholic, he lectures in the afternoon and he would finish in the morning, you know, and people and the students would just kind of be in there, they would fall asleep, they would wake up and he was still talking. Um, and uh, he had a very interesting idea of a kind of universe, his own version of universal knowledge. Uh, and this is a kind of um, uh, schemata for his visionary understanding of the college. Um, in the center is the college in Black Mountain, painting, drawing, lithography, publishing house, theater, uh, Black Mountain Review, which was a very uh, important literary journal, uh, very influential in the States. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know if you can read some of that. Um, uh, advisory Council, Council, at this time, Carl Jung, uh, uh, Norbert Wiener, the founder of uh, cybernetics, uh, Franz Klein, William Carlos Williams. I mean, there are always uh, very important American intellectuals who were somehow brought in as supporters, sometimes as just names, sometimes uh, in raising financial resources, but also in giving uh, uh, some uh, moral support to the college. Um, uh, yeah, these are uh, books written by him. This is interesting because um, uh, it's a, a, an example uh, that we have of interdisciplinary creative uh, practice. Um, uh, the glyph, the third, I don't know if I have any more in here. No, I don't. But uh, the glyph uh, was actually a, a poem by Charles Olson uh, and then Ben Sean, uh, who's an American painter, uh, painted something to it. And the composer Lou Harrison wrote a musical piece and actually went further. You know, it's like you think of like uh, playing telephone, that it just, there were more of the uh, artistic figures in different areas that produced works related to the glyph. Um, uh, there was a dance performance also. Uh, uh, and um, uh, in, in the way that, you know, in this case, a text, it could be an image, would be then worked on with various members of the faculty and students. I should also say that there was not such a division between faculty and students. So sometimes when I was doing my research, I was confused about who was actually a student and who was a, you know, who was a teacher, because um, they were often not so far in age from each other, and especially in the, la in the late period. Um, uh, these artists have chosen to teach uh, at Black Mountain, uh, again, uh, and this is actually, I, I, I research the FBI files because, of course, um, uh, it was very suspect. Uh, in fact, I have yeah, in the text, in the mid-1950s, the college gradually passed through a process of reduction and eventual dissolution as the approaching dark clouds of the Cold War area encouraged a relentless intervention of the FBI against what was seen as a hotbed of intellectuals, foreigners, communists, Jews, homosexuals, and African Americans. So of course, as the conservative 50s, the post-war period gradually took hold, what's called the McCarthy period in the States, and um, so everyone was suspect. And then there was this kind of, in the middle of nowhere, in this very conservative area, um, uh, this concentration. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, and also, I think something that was very difficult um, was that uh, the, um, uh, 
they were, uh, Ted Dreyer and some of the earlier figures um, had more contact either through the art world, uh, uh, especially through the art world, to some individuals with money, you know, because they were very dependent. But, you know, the poets, they had no really connection to this. So even though Charles Olson had an incredible vision of what the college was could be, um, it was having a harder and harder time. So the last winters, I read letters with, you know, uh, that they didn't have, there was a, um, uh, Stefan Volpe, who was the, one of the last emigres from Europe, uh, quite a famous and important composer from Germany. Um, I found letters him writing to Leonard Bernstein asking for uh, money to buy a coat. Yeah, so you can imagine. <laughs> and um, so the end of my text here, in the mid-1950s, the college gradually, okay, I wrote that, as, as the college ne neared its final years, the poet and former student Michael Rumacher later remembers, the hour had finally come, unaware to us that the varied and multiple shapes and ideas and perceptions spawned at Black Mountain over the last years were ready to be scattered out into the world. Uh, the Black Mountain diaspora was a quasi-biblical process of dispersion, yet the pattern's reverberation has, has persisted to the current day. So um, this is something that really resonated with me because um, I understood, I mean, there had been an interchange, of course, with New York, to some degree with San Francisco also at that time, especially for the poets uh, and some of the artists, uh, but especially New York, uh, basically through the whole history of Black Mountain, and especially after the war, because of course, a lot of the, many of the figures, not all, but many of them were coming from the New York avant-garde, and, and I'm talking about also students. I mean, so someone like Ray Johnson, a very interesting figure who was a student there, came back to New York. And, you know, there were other streams, you know, of course, which came then, also Fluxus, et cetera. But um, this college ended in 1957, and there was this process of attrition of, of, of uh, all these artists going to New York. And I realized as I was involved in this project that... Um, uh, because I grew up in New York, that it had to do with me, and that, uh, or not directly with my history, but only in the sense that um, my peers were actually, some of them had either been in Black Mountain or had studied with those who were at Black Mountain. I mean, it was a sort of this tentacles that went out. It wasn't really so spoken about. Um, I kind of listed some of the places here. Former students and faculty gravitated to New York and beyond to the West Coast, where, <coughs> where net, networks of activity and connection continue to develop. Dan Rice, Cy Twomley, William de Kooning, and uh, Franz Klein socialized at the legendary Cedar Tavern in the late 50s. And actually, I found references that they, they with, to each other, they referred to it as Black Mountain North. Uh, experiments in art and technology is a f uh, quite uh, legendary and, and uh, important uh, project, uh, an organization inspired by the interdisciplinary ideas of John, of, uh, uh, John Cage, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, David, and David Tudor. Um, John Cage taught the legendary classes the New School for Social Research. It's set itself founded by members of the, the, the New School for Social Research, founded by re refugees from the Frankfurt School. And uh, in his classes were many, many Fluxus artists, George Brecht and uh, many others. Um, so you see that the, in, in so many different mediums uh, uh, spanning out um, uh, uh, happenings. Uh, Alan Capro, founder of Happenings, was in those classes. Um, uh, likewise, countless American colleges and experimental little arts edu ed ed institutions, um, maybe you know some of them in the States, but they were somehow influenced by this legacy, Goddard College, uh, Mills College, etc. And then the Black Mountain Poets were active in New York and San Francisco, uh, different college campuses, including uh, State University of New York at Buffalo, where I studied, where where uh, before I was there, um, uh, Charles Olson was teaching and also Robert Creeley and a number of others. Um, former student Harvey Lichtenstein uh, went on to direct the Next Wave Festival, Book and Academy of Music. And then maybe even more important, the Gatehill Community Cooperative at Stony Point, which I remember. 
uh, and I visited. I didn't really understand. I was very young. What I mean, I knew that there were all these famous people there and interesting people, but I didn't really understand why they were together there. And uh, um, uh, was founded according to the ideas of Black Mountain College. Uh, teacher Paul Goodman, uh, interesting intellectual. Um, uh, uh, who was actually one of the few who was thrown out of Black Mountain College for being too uh, too radical. So uh, it was hard to, to do that. Um, and uh, it included John Cage, David Tudor, M.C. Richards, Stan Vanderbeek, uh, whose movie Drome was designed for multiple film projections, reflected his studies with Buckminster Fuller. And then the Judson Church Performance Program, also extremely important. Um, other... Uh, uh, co art, artist collectors' in initiatives in the 60s and 70s can be considered in relation to Black Mountain College. Uh, in fact, the diaspora from Black Mountain had already begun in earlier years as those who departed were established throughout the United States and later in Europe. Annie and Joseph Alvarez went to Yale University. Anna and Fritz Merlinhoff to Chicago. Uh, I don't go into the details. There's actually John Averts, who was a major figure at Black Mountain College in music, ended up um, uh, being responsible for re the rebuilding of cultural life in Germany after the war. So this was a completely surprising uh, uh, development, which actually um, uh, has to do with the founding of the DAAD in Berlin. Uh, also, there's some CIA connections there, but that's another discussion. Uh, uh, Irvin Strauss, Zanti Shavinsky in Switzerland, etc. So um, I wrote the lines of influence and connection emanating from these and other examples have been truly remarkable. Um, and, and that many of these figures were somehow the generation of my peers or the peers of my peers. Um, and so um, uh, I understood that also the, you know, this incredible collective energy, uh, not to, to be maybe be careful about being nostalgic, but of the of this of the 60s and 70s um, partially comes from this energy and these experiences and um, because I uh, I often speak about the fact that uh, my my memory in I don't know if I said this yesterday but my my memory of the of the end of the 60s and the 70s in the in the arts and I speak of all the arts was of this feeling that of everyone um, somehow um, working in different mediums but somehow being you know part of the same wave and, and, and feeling like we were all somehow in some community together, which quickly disappeared. Um, and, and of course, it, it also I should mention that it had, uh, uh, I had to reflect on the fact that I was now in Berlin and um, uh, where many of them had left and where it had actually began. So, um, and then my story turns, like how did I get involved in this? Um, I was invited to first a symposium organized by the Hamburger Bahnhof in, in preparation for the first uh, um, historical exhibition about Black, Black Mountain. I don't know what's the next slide. Uh, and uh, the exhibition was to be called an interdisciplinary experiment. I'm sorry, it's in German there. Uh, um, and they, uh, I was invited by the curators uh, uh, Eugen Bluma, who was then the director, who I had worked with for a, a number of other exhibitions, and uh, the later director, um, Gabriela Knopstein, to develop a kind of performative archival exhibition within this project. And, uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm looking for a picture that would show. So what I proposed uh, um, was a workshop space for artists, so I propose to invite students from 11 different art academies, I referred to this yesterday, and, um, and to give them a kind of a workshop space but which would be visible, and it was actually at the end of the exhibition. Uh, and uh, um, so you would walk through the exhibition and then you would arrive at this place, you would see young people kind of working, there was a blackboard which showed which uh, school was in residence and they could put up on the blackboard different activities that they would do um, and it was important that it wasn't only visual arts students that uh, be students from different academies of course I originally proposed that they would be all mixed but this was uh, administratively impossible and um, uh, so the um, and then 
uh, my proposal, okay, I had worked on, uh, on other projects where I had um, developed archival, done uh, archival research, and uh, a part of the project was support to um, uh, spend a year uh, um, uh, researching material, and fortunately I was in residency in, in Boston at that time at MIT. I had the, uh, the uh, library of MIT, which could get any book from the States. I visited uh, also with the curators to Black Mountain, to the site. Uh, there's an archive in, uh, 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 now in, uh, in Asheville. Uh, where all the, where not all the material, but a lot of the material is with a, uh, an archivist who kind of, she was changed her life. She knew nothing about it. She knew nothing about the arts or this history. And when she discovered it, she, it changed her life. And uh, she was also involved in the exhibition and also um, at the uh, other materials or at the Charles Olson collection, which was in Connecticut, the uh, Albers Foundation, uh, and then collecting other materials from publications and so forth. And um, this archive is the result of that. I think you see it back here. Um, and uh, in fact, if I go back, so the concept was that um, uh, this is actually a, a poster which is showing the, the, in, the, the, um, uh, uh, the contents of the archive, which is divided into different categories and uh, about individual figures, all the material that I could find. Um, these are all photocopies, of course, not original materials. I still actually all have, I have this material. And, uh, and the idea was that they would be working on and develop projects partially in inspiration or, or in response to uh, what was in the exhibition and also what was in the, um, in the archive. And then at certain times, according to a score that I, this is an example of one of the scores from a particular day, uh, um, they would go out to four different locations and actually perform. They would either read a text, a predetermined text from the archive, or they would, or they would perform their response from it. And, uh, and this went on for four months in the mornings and afternoon. Uh, it was a very interesting situation because it was also unantic unanticipated uh, collision of expectations in exhibition. So normally there is nobody in the exhibition other than the guards. And suddenly there are people there uh, to, with whom one can interact with and talk with. Uh, and then there was a situation that they are working and uh, uh, so, but then there's an audience kind of watching them work and sometimes the audience would uh, talk to them about what they were doing or they would go in and actually use the archive and so forth. So, and uh, also the different groups invited guests, I invited guests uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, so example of this, so working tables, I'm gonna go through this a little bit. Uh, and uh, an example, I mentioned the Blackboard. Um, these are two schools that were there at the same time, a dance academy uh, and a, um, uh, this is the Hochschule in Bern, uh, uh, a club, performance arts class and lunch co concert. And then under it says, and uh, an attempt to make advances to John Cage's Williams mix. Uh, and, um, and you see contemporary practice choreography, dance, and so forth. This was um, uh, uh, dancers, a dance uh, a class from Berlin that actually spent a lot of time dancing through the exhibition. And so these are kind of interventions in the exhibition. So you'd be standing, maybe there was a special room, only dealing with the Albers trip to Mexico with, with examples of their work and uh, examples of, of uh, the kind of, because they had a collection of, of uh, um, Mesoamerican art, and, uh, and then suddenly someone would stand up and, and read a text about that, or maybe in contrast to that. And also, uh, these dance performances took place, and you know, the audience experienced that. So it was really kind of a living exhibition. This was the workshop in the archive of recreating Williams' mix from tape recorders. I think they got through uh, a short period of time, but, um, and then after that, I, um, uh, uh, where I teach, I, I always considered this archive as a, as a mobile archive, you know, that could be brought in and installed in different situations. So here in the school where I teach, uh, it was a different architecture. We set up the archive, 
Um, the occasion was a symposium, so where there were invited guests, international guests, speaking about Black Mountain. It was in collaboration with my uh, a colleague of mine who's from the philosophy, from the theory department, who is very interested in pragmatism, which is the school of philosophy that Dewey comes from, and uh, and so uh, uh, there were also um, scholars speaking about that in the position of Dewey, and also uh, a number of those who had uh, dealt specifically with the history of Black Mountain College, and also of individual artists, uh, and there were artists speaking about their work who were invited. Um, and uh, uh, with my class, I mean, there were, of course, there were lectures. There were a number of different spaces. Um, there, um, I, I uh, uh, initiated what I called interventions where members of the class would suddenly break up the, the lectures and read a text or read two texts at the same time or do a performance. So there were a number of different... Oh, sorry. Oh. That's weird. Okay. Uh, here, there. Uh, sorry. Okay. There's, there's a video later that seems to want to be activated. Various kinds of performances here in the archive. Student. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, here, different student works, what we call BMC Labor, which is an area where um, uh, discussions and workshops took place. Um, very interesting group that I was, uh, 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 I'm still in touch with called Versatorium from Vienna. They actually, they practice translation. It's actually, they're, they're coming from a literary background and, and one, of the, one of the members actually then later studied in Kiel. Um, they practice a kind of collective translation where they sit down at a table with a group and anybody can join and then they dissect a text. They can spend hours on five words. And, uh, um, and they did this with Black Mountain in the Hamburger Bahnhof and I invited them again. And then there were uh, this kind of collective readings and investigations into particular texts from the archive. And I should say that um, okay, I've been working on a book, which is very slow because the academic world is very slow, but um, which involves these two projects, and uh, that should be, uh, I hope that will be coming out in the next few months. Uh, and then a few other short projects that I did, um, I was invited to this uh, project uh, symposium at the Academy de Kunst in Berlin about the Bauhaus. This is the Bauhaus year uh, in 2019. And I created a reading which was, um, uh, I took, they asked specifically for me to do something with the heritage of, of, uh, of the Albers, uh, of both Annie and, and Joseph Albers. And I took texts that they wrote in English from the Black Mountain period, reminiscing about the Bauhaus and also about their situation in the States. Uh, and they were read by three radio speakers. It was kind of a, a radio play. Uh, uh, that was performed, uh, also where I perform live music. Uh, and then this goes into a whole other area, I hope you're all still with me, I know this is really long, uh, where, um, uh, okay, there are a number of other projects uh, which are interesting here, and um, uh, one of them is uh, 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 the uh, Free International University, which maybe some of you have heard of from Joseph Boys. Um, it's legendary, um, and I was able, so because I, through my contacts in the Academy der Kunste in Berlin, uh, um, uh, Klaus Steck, who's the former director, was very close to Beuys, and he was the lawyer, he was a lawyer um, uh, who actually helped set up the foundation or the association uh, in the early 1970s, and he has the, he gave me copies of the um, the minutes of the discussions of this foundation to f found this free international university, which I found very interesting. And so what's, um, uh, uh, in contrast to Black Mountain, this is a utopian project that never actually happened. I mean, it lived on as a kind of art project, uh, you know, bottles of wine with FIU labels. There's There are still some former, there was kind of a network of, uh, sort of divisions of this uh, uh, of this FIU Free International University that or spread around Europe and even in North America, uh, and there are some descendants of that. 
There were performances by boys and installations, also a documenta. Um, but what I found so interesting about these protocols, what I call the, the protocols of the future of this project, was that they actually, and I was found it very surprised, they were actually um, going, talking about making a real university. So, um, and the German uh, uh, writer Heinrich Böll, who's, this was very surprising to me, this connection, but he turned out to be a very important figure who actually made a course plan and, uh, and they discussed over years what this should be and what it should not be. And basically what happened is that, uh, and, and Klaus Steck told me that at the point that, that they actually, this Klaus Steck figure, he found a building, he was looking for financing uh, in Dusseldorf. At that moment, Boyce lost interest. And I uh, said, no, 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 I don't want to do this, uh, which I think is an interesting aspect. It's another discussion, but about, you know, um, uh, the you know realization of all the problems that come with it actually founding an institution and letting it letting it be a kind of metaphorical theoretical construct. Um, but I also create a number of readings uh, um, projects from those texts where actually they're read. I actually they're reenactments of the meetings because in fact these protocols are, are protocols re records of meetings and they're written in the third person. I changed them into the, I just changed them grammatically into the first person in German, and they were read by artists. In this case, it was in a very appropriate, in an exhibition in the Kunstmuseum Bern, uh, uh, related to Robert Filou, who also, the Fluxus artist, who also wrote a, a manifesto uh, about education, learning and education, uh, uh, called Republique Geniale. And in there, I set up an installation of posters uh, that I created from the texts of, of uh, the Free International University, many of which are very important today about education, uh, very political, and I reenacted these um, uh, these days. So they're you know with the day and address and time uh, where these figures uh, uh, discuss you know what could education be. And okay, of course it's interesting. There's no women. And Ava Boyce says like two words. And, uh, and there's all kinds of very important figures as guests. Uh, Rudy Duchka was the head of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Red, you know, was involved in the Red Army faction and, and the student protests in Germany, very important figure uh, who was then execute, kind of executed in the street. He, uh, uh, he was present at some of the meetings. So it was, it was a real uh, hotbed of German intellectuals no women, a lot of hot talk, and uh, it was interesting that there was actually a practical strain, and this is not publicly known, that actually there was a, a, an idea to actually create an institution, but it never took place. And then I end with, these are some images from this, people could take the posters at the end. I come to the last project, um, which, is, uh, which is very recent, this was in September. Um, there was in Dusseldorf, uh, I guess was it the hundredth birthday of Boyce or of his death, probably his birth. Uh, there was a, a Boyce year in Dusseldorf and Eugen Blume, who originally invited me to take part in the Black Mountain Project, was the main curator and director of this. Uh, also, um, and there were many different projects during the year. Uh, and there was one project called Sculptural Democracy. This is the uh, creation of a kind of laboratory. It was called Live In Lab. Uh, um, and uh, it was together with an architecture collective uh, with which I've worked uh, called uh, Raum Labor, La Raum Spatial Laboratory, which is based in Berlin. They just won the Golden Lion at the Architecture Biennale. And uh, their architects, they don't build anything that stays, so which allows them to do things which you could never normally build because of the restrictions, especially in Germany. They, um, they're very close to artistic practice and how they work. They're also extremely um, uh, uh, deal with materials that can be reused. And, uh, um, and the idea was to develop a, a kind of a meeting called Live-In Lab. I don't have the, uh, uh, 
which, which was um, uh, uh, a group inviting artists, architects, utopian thinkers from different countries to come together in an outdoor space in front of the, um, the uh, Dusseldorf Schauspielhaus. It's the theater, the state theater, in an open square. Um, they reused, this uh, Round of the War reused pieces of American airplanes, uh, <laughs> which were part of a stage set which they had uh, developed for, for the theater. And in this, it was 10 days, uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, um, I mean, I stayed in a hotel. Some of they had actually living quarters in the square for some of the participants. Um, but I was basically outside from 10 in the morning until the evening uh, with a group. And we called ourselves, okay, my project was called The Archive as Artistic Practice. And uh, uh, an interdisciplinary uh, workshop this is what the group called themselves, the Post Archive Cooperative Memory Keepers. The first thing was a uh, poster campaign of my f uh, free international university posters, and uh, which was all over Dusseldorf. And then uh, this is a picture from our group. We were in a, actually a building which was used before as a kind of, uh, there's a kind of tribuna built, and okay, it's too complicated to get to talk about this, but there was a structure which is where the mixing board and everything was, which is built outside, and we used that as our uh, center space. Um, we created an installation at the end from our research. These are the boxes from my Black Mountain archive, which I brought there, and uh, I also brought the, uh, the uh, Free International University materials, and so we spent a lot of time talking about, um, you know, this utopian communities and about education. They were coming from very, it was actually an interesting mixture of artists and, yeah, architecture. Uh, uh, they're not, weren't students, they were recently graduated, and they were from many different countries. So from, one was from Ecuador, from New York, from uh, uh, Germany, from Turkey, from a number of different countries. And we spent this 10 days together, um, and part of what we were doing was to um, try to communicate with all the other projects and develop an archive from all the things that took place there. So in real time, uh, uh, this is a picture that one of the students uh, uh, staged because it turned out that the, this kind of uh, steel construction was exactly the same as the studies building in Black Mountain. And so this picture is from a book about Black Mountain College of a woman looking out the window. And so she <laughs> staged this here. Uh, this was a student project with kind of uh, 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 going out and trying to communicate with the community uh, with a microphone and uh, uh, a video camera. Uh, we asked for information to be collected from the different groups which was very international. We staged the readings again. Uh, uh, we staged as a reading the, um, uh, 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 the protocols of the Free International University. And among here, there are kind of students, artists, but also um, uh, some professors from the, uh, 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 the Art Academy in Dusseldorf. Okay, this is the space where we were the whole time. So... Uh, which changed every day, and we and we ate together and lived together. So that was a very, I mean, I have to say, I remember my wife said when I came back that I seemed to be like in a, coming out of another world, and I think we all the, the weather was really good. It was coming out of this COVID period, but we we're outside all the time, and uh, uh, we ate three meals a day outside there, and. Um, and it was a tremendous interaction between the different groups, which had very different focuses. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it was one of the first times in recent years where I felt like, okay, it's a short period, uh, it's an intense period, but one could experience this moment, which of, of interaction, of kind of a community uh, among the arts and, uh, uh, and, and discussion which was actually working. So it was uh, really a very inspiring uh, uh, moment.